Well, good morning and good tag. Good morning and good afternoon from Pittsburgh to New York to Berlin and elsewhere. My name is David Gill. I'm the German Consul General in New York, also serving the state of Pennsylvania and the wonderful city of Pittsburgh. And I'm very glad to be with you today and grateful that this program is hosted in partnership with the Wunderbar Together campaign of the German government, the American Council on Germany, and the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh. Many people in Germany and elsewhere remember Chancellor Angela Merkel's famous words when she said five years ago, wir schaffen das. In English, we can do it, or maybe even, yes, we can. Her words reflected a very enthusiastic and open societal atmosphere when hundreds of thousands of people volunteered to help refugees to settle in our country. But the enthusiasm of the first weeks after the opening of the borders eventually gave way to a more sober, some would say more realistic approach. It also brought visit a rise in skepticism and sometimes even hostility. However, as we look back over the last years, we can state with some pride that Germany has had many successes in welcoming and integrating over a million people. The acceptance of refugees has led to many controversial debates in our country, but also in the US and elsewhere. For Germany, there's an additional aspect I want to mention. Until a few years ago, our country did not consider itself to be a country of immigration. In the same tradition, for instance, of the uh, USA, the term Gastarbeiter, or guest workers, illustrates the decades-long misconception that foreign workers and their families would leave again at some point. This lack of understanding of the role of the foreign worker was an obstacle that needed to be overcome. Sometimes, even today, you can still see traces of this debate. The crisis in the world with wars, armed conflicts, ethnic or religious fights, climate changes or pandemics will further push more and more people to leave their homelands in order to find places to live. As a result, we may never be able to declare that this is a problem that we have solved. That is why joint responses by the international community are so necessary. Just last week, Chancellor Merkel issued a government statement calling for progress in the EU asylum and migration policy. With regards to the Moria camp on the Greek island of Lesbos and its devastating destruction, she said that if in the long term no common basis is found between the member states of the European Union on the issue of migration, this would have a devastating impact on Europe's ability to act. Germany, as a strong country now holding the EU Council presidency, can and will certainly make a substan substantial contribution. So what is the German federal government doing in, on the field of migration and integration. We stand by the constitutional fundamental right to asylum and the protection of refugees under the Geneva Convention. We want to combat the root causes of why people have to flee and not combat the refugees themselves. And we want to do so together with the international community, including the EU. We want to further reduce illegal migration to Europe and instead strengthen safe, orderly, legal migration on a controlled scale. Having said that, I'm looking forward to the discussion and hand over now to Yvonne. Thank you so much, uh, Consul General, and I'm very pleased to welcome all of you in behalf of the World Affairs Council of America, the American Council of 
Germany and the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh. My name is Yvonne Smith-Tapia. I'm the Senior Director of Programs and Impact at the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh. And I'm very honored to introduce you to our uh, uh, moderator and a uh, great guest speakers today. Uh, our moderator is Regina Omdor. She is the Senior Program Officer for Africa at Relief International based in Washington, DC. Uh, prior to Relief International, Regina worked with Partner for Work, the workforce development organization for the city of Pittsburgh and Allegheny County. And she was engaged in Mayor Peruro's uh, Welcoming Pittsburgh initiative. She gained experience across the public, private, and nonprofit sectors in Europe and the US. Uh, Regina is originally from Kenya and grew up in Germany, so her experience is going to be very relevant for this conversation. Uh, we have two great speakers, Victoria uh, Rijik and David Lubel. Victoria is the head of the German Council of Foreign Relations Migration Program. She began her professional career at the United Nations Institute for Training and Research in New York, working on migration and development. She later worked at various think tanks in Washington, DC, including as a policy analyst for the Migration Policy Institute. She also served as an independent expert on migration, asylum, and refugee issues, advising government offices and foundations, including the German Development Agency and the US Department of State. David is the founder of Welcome in America that works with over 200 cities and towns across the US supporting nonprofits and local governments to transform their communities into inclusive spaces. David recently shifted his focus to the organization's international efforts as the founding director of the Welcome in International program based in Berlin. As you can see, we have great experts today to engage in a very interesting topic. I thank you all for being here and Regina, please take it away. Thank you so much, Yvonne, uh, and also Consul General Gill for this very warm welcome and the, the lovely introduction. I'm very excited uh, to be part of this conversation today and particularly pleased to be able to discuss this topic with two excellent speakers who have dedicated their entire careers to this topic. I also wanna welcome everyone who has joined us to listen today. We are very keen to have this be a real conversation between all of us. So we would love to get your questions and your feedback. As you're listening to the conversation, please uh, feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A function in Zoom and I will make sure to discuss as many of them as possible during our Q&A portion. Um, so yeah, please don't hesitate to participate today. Uh, this conversation today is personally very near and dear to my heart. I immigrated to Germany from Kenya uh, in 91 um, with my mother as a small child and um, you know, this was obviously just shortly after German reunification. And at that time and throughout the 90s, you know, we've had a lot of uh, immigrants from, you know, the former uh, Yugoslavia, former Soviet Union, and, uh, you know, also other countries from Eastern Europe and Southeast Europe. Um, at that time, I don't really remember the process personally of integrating into German society. Um, but I do remember, for example, in uh, the small city that I grew up in northern Germany, there weren't really any, you know, immigrants uh, from Africa uh, like us. Uh, so, and we didn't really participate in any programming that I'm, that I was aware of. But in this kind of context, I feel very fortunate to, to have been able to really develop quite naturally a, a very strong German identity. And what's even more important to me personally is uh, to always have felt, you know, acknowledged and accepted by my fellow Germans as a German. And um, I think that's the, the part that is personally very important to me. And I definitely know that it's, it's a fortunate uh, experience. There, there were issues. I'm not going to, you know, say everything was always easy, but I think there were quite few. So I've had a very positive integration experience myself. Um, yeah, then in 2014, I moved to Pittsburgh and was able to learn a lot about immigration strategies there. And then when 2015 came around with the, um, you know, so-called crisis in Germany and Europe, it was quite, quite interesting to see and to have to observe it from the outside. 
Um, speaking of like 2015, um, I think I would love to, to take us back as Consul General Gill has just reminded us of, uh, you know, the famous statement that Angela Merkel made when she said, we, wir schaffen das, we can manage this. Um, Victoria, I would like to start with you. Now, five years later, um, I think it's a good time now to, to really reflect what's been accomplished so far in Germany and also in Europe. Can you set the stage for us um, in terms of German and European migration um, policy? Where, you know, where are we? What's been accomplished uh, since the famous statement of Chancellor Merkel? Thank you, Regina, and thanks everyone for, for joining, for the invite. I'm looking at the participants and we just cracked 100. So uh, it's, it's wonderful to see that there is such widespread interest in the topic both of migration um, and in Germany. So thank you all for tuning in and I'll do my very best to say things that uh, might be at least somewhat insightful. Um, very much supported, of course, by, by David and Regina. You asked, can you set the stage, what has happened since 2015 in Germany? I'm happy to do that, of what has been going well, of what has not been going so well, and also what's happening on the EU level right now. I'll say a few words on the new pact that was published um, just a few weeks back. Mm -hmm. So there has been a lot of flurry around um, the five-year anniversary of the Wir schaffen das statement. Um, and a lot of this flurry was tinged positive. So we have a lot of success stories to tell these days in Germany. One of the success stories on integration is about the labor market. Um, we have often read now, if you've followed the media, that about half of people about five years after arrival actually are in jobs and contributing to, um, to our uh, social security system. You uh, might have also heard that um, housing is going really well. So people are moving out of mass accommodations and uh, they are moving into private houses and apartments. So um, we have about three out of four people living in private apartment houses and that's um, risen a lot since about uh, only half people had that in 2016. Um, on the labor market integration, we see that there's a huge gender gap, of course, right? So women are only about half as likely to work as men, and that probably drops a lot if there's a child under four in the household. Um, I think everyone can relate to that to some degree, and that is not overly surprising. Um, one reason why there has been so much celebration about the labor market integration outcomes so far is that this cohort of arrivals has integrated somewhat more quickly than prior cohorts. Now, if you want to be very positive, you say that is because we have all these great integration systems in place now. And if you are a little less romantic, it is because we have a really good labor market going on. So low unemployment rates and that, of course, also helps. Um, last thing on education, children are in school. So nearly all the children that arrived are in school. About 80% are in either primary or secondary education. 15% are in vocational education and training. Um, and about 5% are waiting to enter school or are not in school. That is relatively high because there's a lot of 17 year olds, of course, among them. So overall, this is a good trajectory. It is not perfect. It's you know still a long way to go. But overall, this is better than a lot of people had feared in 2015 and better than a lot of the experiences that we've had uh, in the past. Mm -hmm. Now, what's not going so well? Well, what's not going so well is a lot of people in our country and a growing number in our country don't have a legal status. Mm -hmm. So that, of course, is a discussion that is well known in the United States and is becoming more and more known in uh, Germany. In the last seven years, also due to the crisis, the number of people without a legal status that live in Germany has doubled. So we're now at about a quarter of a million people. And you see that in integration outcomes, because of course your legal status matters in how well you do at school and what your chances are on the labor market. So we see that uh, consistently that people that are in deferred deportation, which is comparable to the uh, US DACA status, are actually doing less well. Uh, the students that are in school are doing less well. They're less likely to be in their own private housing and more likely to be in, a, uh, in, 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 uh, in mass facilities. And of course, no matter where you stand politically and how you call that population, whether you call them undocumented or sans papier, or you call them illegals, doesn't matter what you call them. I think there is a broad, broad agreement that a large number of people that live in the shadows is not a good thing. It's not good for the people themselves. And it's also not good 
for the country, of course, um, not least of all because it is a big administrative hassle to actually continue to renew these permits um, and to keep the chances from these people. Um, so that really is kind of one of the new frontiers that Germany needs to address in the next five to 10 years to come, unless it wants this, pro this problem, this challenge to, um, to spiral the way that it has done really in the United States. And I think the right strategy to approach that would be a combined strategy of a lot more regularizations in the US, you call it path to citizenship, but also um, a focus on more humane, but also more effective returns because Germany's return system is actually not at all up to the challenge right now. Last thing I'll say on the other big frontier, of course, is the European level. Um, we've just seen the publication of the new pact um, on asylum and migration. Um, this is a proposal that the European Commission has put forward and that was announced as a big new move by the Commission to finally break through the deadlock that we've seen since 2015 on EU level. Now, sadly, there's not a whole lot of new things in the new pact um, and the first reactions towards the new pact have been quite critical. I'm sure we're going to go into that a little bit later, but I think this is the other big question mark that's hanging over Germany's migration head in a way. What is the future of uh, the European Union asylum system? Yeah. I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, uh, Victoria. This is very um, interesting to see that there has been definitely some really good progress and you've talked about uh, the economic part of uh, the integration with the access to labor market. Uh, you know, schooling and, and training and things like that. So that's that's really kind of encouraging in a way. Um, how about the kind of other side in terms of cultural integration? I mean, integration can mean a lot of different things to different people. Um, what can you say about, you know, the aspect of cultural integration when it comes to language or um, other pieces? In Germany, we've had, you know, Werte Diskussion meaning you know a debate around cultural values and how they match or don't match always yeah. <laughs> i'm very hesitant to speak about cultural integration because i like to talk about integration things you can actually measure and when it comes to all those value discussions there's a lot of subjectivity involved about what is our culture what should be our culture of course, a lot of this discussion about cultural integration is based on some flawed premises, right? I mean, in Germany, we've had some conversations about it's important to learn German. Of course, it's important to learn German, but you know, where do you really like draw the line between what's reasonable demand and what is just unnecessary pressure? So, for instance, some particularly uh, daft uh, ideas that were that were uh, fluctuated in the German debate have been that migrants should, uh, should talk German at home at all times. And of course, if you've ever been a person speaking any language at home, you know that it is, it is you know, behavior at home is notoriously hard to monitor or to enforce. So really, you know that the purpose of bringing up proposals like that is absolutely not towards furthering the integration debate. It is merely geared towards uh, pandering to voters that are, um, that have xenophobic uh, streaks, you know? And I think that because of that, I try to steer clear a little bit from that cultural debate, um, but perhaps David can, can help me here and jump in. Yeah, and I wanted to thank you, Victoria. I, I appreciate your, you know, your honesty there. And this is really um, kind of like where I would also um, see that. But David, I would love to pass on the overall um, question to you. So you're a lot of your experience has been working uh, to make communities in the United States um, more welcoming to, to foreigners in general. And um, now that you've taken that work global, what's your, and you're based in Berlin at this moment, so what's your assessment overall on the situation in Germany? Is it similar to Victoria, um, how she described it, or do you see things maybe differently or have another perspective? Sure, thanks, Regina. Um, and I uh, would be remiss uh, before, just as we're starting, if I didn't, uh, having worked in the United States for so long, uh, to say hi to any colleagues from the, any of the efforts on uh, welcoming Pittsburgh, also the efforts in Allegheny County. Um, so, so hi to, to all the welcomers uh, in, in the Pittsburgh area and elsewhere. 
uh, on this on this line. I also want to point out that I've done the opposite of you, Regina. I grew up in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, uh, other side of the state, but still Pennsylvania, and now uh, have have uh, migrated with my family to uh, to Berlin, to, to Germany. So we we have uh, mirror image experiences. Um, but uh, to to answer your question, I I, I agree with the uh, with. with Everything that, that Victoria said around around um, you know how things are are looking, but I do have different angles, uh, which is why we uh, have panels to get those different angles. And so I'll just give you my sort of my angle, my 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 perspective. It is it is very much a, a community um, community based uh, perspective. We work with communities. Uh, Around the world, uh, not not just in Germany. Um, we, we work in at Buckley International. Works with um, we have national partners in in nine countries. Some of them are governments. Some of them are nonprofits um, that then manage networks of cities uh, that are uh, advancing welcoming um, in their in their communities. And so, in, in Germany, we're supporting. Uh, the Bertelsmann Foundation, uh, as well as the um, as, as well as Fineo, which, which is a non nonprofit an NGO, that's a support a network of um, what's going to be 40 cities across Germany um, that are trying to create uh, welcoming policies for immigrants and refugees, but also a welcoming culture. Um, so, so with that said, uh, yeah, I, I definitely uh, have paid attention also to the cultural piece. Um, I, I'm, uh, I was floored when the statistic came out that 75% of refugees um, feel at home at Germ in Germany. Um, that, that statistic came in the same report that talked about the 50% in the workforce. And I was really impressed by that, um, that number. I don't think, yeah, I mean, coming from the United States right now, I have my doubts about whether that, that, that same statistic would hold uh, in the United States, unfortunately. Um, but that was, that was uh, very uh, interesting to me that that was the case. Um, and yeah, from, from my opinion, in my opinion, in general, uh, communities uh, that we are working with across Germany, you know, struggled. Um, we, we started working with communities in Germany uh, in, in really in 2014, before Welcome International even existed, we had an exchange program with organizations like Cultural Vistas and the Bosch Stiftung and others to, to have exchanges between cities. And even back then, um, yeah, cities were struggling they were, and communities were struggling with uh, the, the large numbers of people coming in. Um, and uh, there was backlash happening as we, uh, you know, from my work, I know that that's inevitable. Um, when you have rapid growth and integration. But what we've seen since then is that there has been a welcome. Um, it's been impressive. Again, not perfect, like Regina, you talked about, not perfect, your, your experience. Um, but considering the numbers, um, extraordinarily positive overall. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, there, there are definitely, there's a lot of room to grow. Uh, and we work uh, in the east uh, of Germany as well as the west of Germany, and, and there's more room to grow. I would say, uh, I think we all would say in, in the east and the west as far as um, resistance to, to uh, people coming into the community, newcomers coming into the community. Um, and we can get more into that, but I, I'm overall, uh, yeah, a little bit, uh, I don't wanna say in awe, but definitely impressed with, um, you know, with all the rhetoric that you still hear on the national level sometimes, when you go on the community level, people want to figure it out for the most part. Um, and they're working to try to, to try to make it work. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. So, so there is something to the, the comms culture uh, that has been discussed. So this is very, very interesting to hear from your perspective. And I'm, and I'm just curious, in your work, um, how have you, you know, kind of systematically assessed um, and measured the degree to which communities are welcoming? Because I think most of us have an intuitive idea about what it means and what it can look like uh, to be welcoming, but maybe there's uh, another, you know, other pieces to it that you look uh, when you work with communities. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure, and I'm not gonna, I could get into a lot of fine detail on this, um, but I'm not, because yeah, it seems very touchy-feely, the idea of welcoming. Um, and, and when we started the work in the United States, it was kind of touchy-feely. It was about having dialogues in church basements and trying to make the climate more welcoming. Um, but since then, you know, we, we identified over time that you need to define what welcoming means. Um, and so in the United States, uh, we, about uh, seven years ago, we started work on creating a, uh, a welcoming standard, um, which is um, all of the policies that a city would need to in, uh, utilize in order to be 
uh, seen as welcoming and we work with stakeholders from across many different sectors, experts uh, to community members, to immigrants and refugees to create these standards. And so in Germany, uh, we, we worked with, uh, supported the Bertelsmann Stiftung uh, and, and Fineo to create a, a, a what, if the program in, in Germany is called Wiltofene Kommune. Um, and I'll, I'll send a link for that in the chat afterwards, including uh, the uh, standard because they, they've developed uh, what they call a subs check. Um, so some standards, like in Australia like, and New Zealand, the national government is our partner, they, they do certification or accreditation of cities as welcoming, um, culturally as well as policy-wise. Um, in Germany, it's a self-check. Um, so there's a lot of different categories and cities can see how they're doing. And, and 40 cities have been funded by the German government to um, undertake an intensive process of, of, of trying to reach the self-check. Um, on all of these different categories, but, but there is a, a quantitative way to measure that we have uh, how, how cities are advancing towards becoming uh, willkommen or welcoming, or as they call it, willtofene, uh, uh, which is world open communities. Yeah, this, that's very interesting. Uh, thanks for, for sharing the link. We'll make sure that um, people uh, have access to that as well. Um, and I would like to go back to um, something that was said before. Um, you know, we've had on the one hand, you know, a lot of welcoming, um, you know, uh, kind of expressions of, of people being welcoming in Germany, especially during the peak in, in 2015 and after, um, you know, with people donating uh, clothes and, and, and toys for children and coming up with community initiatives to make refugees feel welcome and, and all of that. So a lot of civic engagement around that. Um, and then on the other hand, uh, I think we have to also talk about uh, some of the contrasting developments that happen kind of in parallel um, when it comes to the rise of anti-immigrant sentiments, you know, right-wing and, and, and populist movements, not only in Germany, uh, across Europe, and we can even argue that it might be a global phenomenon. Um, and, you know, I'm just wondering, I think in Germany, uh, the most prominent example is the AFD, the Alternative für Deutschland, which uh, made it into the Bundestag, uh, biggest opposition, and, and into the state parliaments, as well as the European Parliament. Um, Victoria, I would like to pass this question to you. How can we um, kind of reconcile these two sides of the same story, so to speak? Is there anything that could have been managed differently throughout the past uh, few years to prevent um, a development like this? Or is this something that was just inevitable because it, there might be you know, a correlation and this happens maybe um, elsewhere as well? What's your, what, what's your take on these kind of two very different sides of the same coin? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, it's, it goes right to the heart of the problem. And I think you cannot reconcile these two parts. You can simply accept that both of them will always exist. And it's all about where within the extremes will the majority of people find themselves. And that, of course, shifts over time. So I think it is important that we mention both the narratives about Germany and both those narratives are true. Both, of the, both these narratives are not incorrect, but they are incomplete unless you also look at the other. You mentioned the rise of the alternative for Germany. They are currently at 10% and in some Eastern German uh, states at you know, a very high double digit number. Um, but you could, you could also mention other ways to measure this, um, this, this uh, kind of more closeness and this shift away from the, from the welcoming culture that we saw in 2015. You could mention the rise in xenophobic um, hate crimes. You could mention all the attacks that have happened on not only migrants, but also anyone who is other, right? So people with a different color of skin, um, people with a different religion, a lot of attacks on synagogues, a lot of attacks on Muslims. All of that is a reality, a very sad reality, but a daily reality in Germany as well. Um, you could also uh, mention, of course, how much the laws in Germany and the legal situation has shifted and has tightened really, right? Migration laws in the last few years, especially asylum laws have tightened quite a bit. Um, there have been a lot of uh, adaptations that have been made to the situation from 2015. 
two big packages were passed that overall kind of had a more closed attitude than, um, than not. And of course, that is exactly the, the development that we've seen Europe-wide and that we also see worldwide. Now, all of this is true, but it's also true that the majority of Germans, six out of 10 Germans say that migration makes our country stronger. And that is actually exactly the same share as in the United States. It's also true that the majority of Germans still say we are willing to take in refugees. We want to give the protection that we've also signed up to under national and international law. But that majority of Germans that are willing to take in refugees also say, but if we do it, it has to be orderly. So there's the fear of the chaos again that we've seen in 2015 of this stretching of existing systems mm -hmm. that Germans are afraid of, I would say. Yeah. Last thing on that, you also see, of course, that there is a difference between the national level and the regional level slash city level mm -hmm. with cities and some states showing an even higher openness to taking in more people. We just saw that recently after the fire in Moria, when various cities and states in Germany offered to take in hundreds of, um, of uh, people from uh, the camp there that had burned down um, and their efforts so far have been blocked by the interior ministry. Mm -hmm. So I think that both of these tendencies exist in Germany. Both of these tendencies also exist in the United States and in many other countries around the world. It is not unusual to see both of these tendencies at the same time and to see, and, and to see them being a bit in competition with each other. I would warn all of us to think that one side is going to win over the other and that it should be our task to, you know, reduce the one side from the other because one side is right and the other isn't because yeah. that's just not the way that migration works. I think the truth is that we have extremes, that most people are between those extremes. And I think what we should aim for is to come to as much as a compromise between extremes, of course, with limits, right? Mm -hmm. But as much as a compromise and acknowledge that some of the fears are legitimate about migration, um, but some of them are not legitimate. And dividing between those, I think is important when you talk about migration publicly and when you support migration publicly, because migration in itself is not necessarily good, but it's also not necessarily bad. Migration can be good and bad. It can have good effects and it can have negative effects depending on how well you manage it with your policies. And that is true for Germany and yeah. the US. Uh, Bupari, I really appreciate uh, your take on this and especially your focus on the um, compromise because I think, yeah, it's very, it's always very problematic if we are trying to quiet one side and, and you know, say it's not legitimate if you feel afraid. Um, so I, I really appreciate kind of that um, emphasis on, on finding compromises and, you know, um, and trying to, you know, to, to, to make sure that we understand elements of both sides in within reason right uh, david just just a, curious about your take on on these two two elements if you uh, have anything that you want to share about that uh, again I, I actually uh, i agree with victoria on that um <clears throat> our, our goal is not to throw off uh some amount of balance uh in in communities whether it's uh in uh, germany or, or elsewhere but we do recognize that that balance can get thrown off in a negative way. And that's what we're really trying to avoid. And I've seen that happen. You see it spiral. So, um, you know, it, what, what, what we find is if you've got a large, uh, and, and what happened in Germany at first too, you've got a large, a large number of people coming to a community that's not used to having refugees. We're not talking about like Hamburg or, or Berlin so much. We're talking about the smaller communities that receive large influxes of immigrants and refugees. Um, if you don't have an infrastructure ready to, to engage the broader community, um, you're, you're, you're gonna have problems and, and the balance is gonna get thrown off. And that can lead to that kind of political ramifications if it's happening in enough communities in, in, in a specific state, state, for example. And so, yeah, a, a big part of our job is making sure that there's an infrastructure to keep that balance. Um, and that, an infrastructure to that extent means do you have uh, you know, is mechanisms to ensure that dialogue is taking place between the newcomers and the longtime uh, residents of that community? Because it doesn't happen on its own. Um, and then when it comes to messaging, we're not talking about propaganda, but there are positive contributions that 
newcomers and, and positive values that are shared that don't make their way to the general population on their own. And so having some sort of mechanism to not, not in a you know, weird way, but just in a kind of uh, organic and natural way to, to highlight some of these stories of, of shared values and, and contributions that newcomers are bringing. Um, and then, yeah, uh, also the leadership matters. And we see that on the national level uh, with, with the, the chancellor here, uh, here in Germany, but on the local level too. And so identifying leaders from, not just from the municipal level, but also business uh, community, religious community, et cetera, who are uh, supportive of, of the newcomers who are coming in so that they can send messages of, of tolerance and messages of uh, you know, the benefits or, or at least um, the, the reason to try to make this work. Um, and so we identify leaders who can, who can play that role and, and, and we help them lift the, their voices up in the community. And so, yeah, if you have all those pieces happening, if you have, uh, we have all other mechanisms to make sure that integration is, is actually designed well. But if you have good policies and programs to integrate people and you have that infrastructure to engage the host society in a community, you can get to the balance that, that Victoria is talking about. Yeah. Thank you, David. And we actually uh, are receiving quite a few number of uh, questions. Um, and maybe this, this first one is um, uh, for, for David. So uh, Hollis Hart is asking about um, what are some of the best practices that uh, created most successful integration of migrants into their communities? Um, David, maybe you can share, you know, what are some of the, um, you know, successful strategies you've seen in Germany? that we might be able to replicate here in the US and maybe even vice versa from your work? Sure, sure. Um, I would say, uh, I, I mean, one of them I just talked about, uh, which yeah. is, uh, is, is receiving, uh, receiving community engagement, um, which um, wasn't, again, uh, at the beginning, it really wasn't that big of a thing. Like people talked about Bill Coleman's culture kind of just being around, but Bill Coleman's infrastructure, infrastructure didn't really, you know, we got to get people housing, we got to get people jobs and, and they got to learn German. Yes, we can do that in, at scale, but, um, you know, the, the infrastructure and the, and the um, pieces that are in place to make sure that the community is going to buy into it. Yeah. Um, that wasn't there, but it's now it's, it's, it's growing and it's starting to be there and cities um, ac across Germany are, are doing that well. I, mean, I could give examples, but it's, it's starting to become more commonplace. But, but I, I talked about that already. What I didn't talk about was um, also multi-sector engagement, whole community engagement. Um, so in Germany, there is a big uh, sort of understanding or thinking that, oh, well, the, the government can do all of this. And, the, uh, and, and often, you know, I'm impressed by what the government can do, although I don't like dealing with the bureaucracy sometimes, to be honest. Um, but uh, still, it's, it's impressive. Uh, but then uh, as far as uh, the, 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 you know, the, the wave that came in 2015, 2016, there were a lot of people in other parts of the, the community that, that wanted to be involved. The business community wanted to help, uh, volunteers wanted to help, but local government wasn't really set up to, to do that well, to engage these other sectors effectively and, and, and incorporate them in. So people were kind of doing stuff on their own, but there's more and more now examples of communities, including all of the communities in this Feltofene Kommune uh, program that are doing multi-sector work. So uh, bringing all of the sectors in a community together, including immigrants and refugees, uh, community groups, business, et cetera. Um, and this is something that Stuttgart did a long time ago. They're, they're really pioneers in this. Uh, and we actually took some of Stuttgart's work to form our model in the United States. Um, so it's one example of a community that did this multi-sector planning. Mannheim is another one that's, that did it uh, early on and has, has done that really effectively. But cities, all, all more and more cities in Germany are recognizing that you can't just have volunteers in one corner, municipal government in the other corner, and think it's going to work out. You, you bring people together, you identify together what the main barriers are to full integration, and then you create a plan and you implement a plan to, to reduce those barriers, whether they be institutional, cultural, or, or whatever. Um, so yeah, that, that along with the receiving community engagement, those are some really important best practices. Thank you, David. That, this, is, this is great. Um, 
We have another. Could I chime in there? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Just for a sec, because I do want to highlight this was such a great way of putting it that welcoming infrastructure is different from welcoming culture, because that's one of the points that I've tried to make, but I never actually managed to put a good label on it. So thank you for giving me that. Because one of the examples I always use is that there are some states in Germany that are considered very open, and Berlin is, of course, one of them, but Berlin is poor. Um, and then there are some states that are considered a, a lot more hardliners, Bavaria being one of them, right, the Texas of Germany. Mm -hmm. um, but, but Bavaria is uh, comparably rich and actually the infrastructure in Bavaria for integration in many ways is much better than in a lot of other states that might have more of a reputation of having a welcoming culture, but because they don't have the welcoming infrastructure, I would say from a migrant's perspective of where will you fare better, it might well be you might be faring better in a more hardline state that is actually richer and that has more services for you available. Um, and if you allow me one last thing on the, you asked what are the different approaches can we learn from each other? Mm -hmm. And of course, that's what we always try to do, right? We try to look at other countries, how are they doing it? And let's steal that idea if it's a good one. And I think that's a good idea in theory, but I've come to believe over the years that the different approach, that even if an approach works really well in one country, it doesn't necessarily translate to the other country. And when it comes to labor market integration, Germany and the United States have really different uh, philosophies behind their way of labor integration. In Germany, you have this approach of slow and steady. Mm -hmm. You come in, you do your language course that is uh, paid for by the federal government, then you do your labor market integration course, then you get this course, and then you do that for a few years, and then you hopefully will be able to go into a vocational education and training and then into a career, you know, into the, into the sunset. That's you know, to, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Yeah. In the US, it's a very different approach. It's the sink or swim approach. It's the, the faster you are self-reliant, the better. If you have a job one week off the boat slash off the plane, that is the best way of, of doing it. And then language acquisition, et cetera, is going to come, come later. And we all tend to think a little more highly of one approach over the other, but I think that's mostly based on what our beliefs are of what a good migrant should be and look like and yeah. when you look at the actual um when you look at the actual integration outcomes of people refugees in germany arriving here and going through that system or in the us and going through that system you really do not get a clear answer of which system is better the only clear answer you get is that both systems have severe trade-offs and work well for some groups and not well for others so don't want to be a, a spoiled sport here completely, but I would caution that only because something worked really well in, in one country, you can uh, translate into the other. Yeah, that's a very good point. Thank you, Victoria. And actually, you, you um, talked about something that an audience member asked here. Um, Steve asked uh, if you can talk about what kinds of people have been able to join the labor market. Um, you've, you've spoken about the language, but um, you know, this audience member is interested in how significant the language barrier is and what, you know, what kind of people are successful in integration uh, into the labor market. Can you say a few more words about that? Victoria? <laughs> oh, sorry, I thought that question was going to go to David. Um, <laughs> There are a few rules of thumbs of who has better chances integrating into the labor market. And um, they are pretty straightforward and self-explanatory. The younger you are, the more the more schooling you've actually had in the country, so in the host country, the easier it's going to be for you to access the labor market. The more higher education your parents have had, the more likely that you are going to pursue the higher education that's true of migrants as it is for everyone else. Yeah. Um, so in general, kind of the, the most easily integratable um, migrant in a way um, is a person who, who comes in young, uh, who comes in and, and gets a lot of support, be it, from the, be it from the parental home or through the policies and infrastructure in place. And I'm so sorry that I cannot give a better answer to this, but it is really not rocket science. Yeah. Because in the end, what migrants need to thrive is what you and I also need to thrive. The same goes for migrant children. And the whole debate, I think, is about how can we make sure that we offer migrants and migrant children similar, if not the same, but similar opportunities to thrive in the new environment that they've entered.
Yeah, thank you, Victoria. Um, I have another question from an audience member. This is for David. Aline Sousa is asking, do you believe that artistic and cultural activities are important to help integrate refugees and migrants into the culture and life of a country? And um, are there uh, artistic activities and arts education um, very helpful or are they more secondary in this process? Um, do you have any, um, anything on that, David? Sure, it's a great, it's a great question. Yeah, um, it's really good because, it, yeah, it, it's, it's definitely important, actually. Uh, and I, I know, again, this is another thing that could feel kind of touchy-feely, but um, the thing about arts and culture, like, if, you know, it's, it's part of, it's a, it's a helpful part of the recipe. It's not, it's, right. I wouldn't argue that you're gonna solve everything around integration with arts and culture, but it's, it's, a, it's a good tool in the toolbox. Um, so where, where I, f have, I find it most helpful um, is, is, this, is this intercultural understanding piece, building bridges piece, um, because you know, in, in communities, you can have uh, you can have dialogues to try to uh, build bridges between and, and understanding between people. You can do this communications work of telling the positive stories. But art does um, have a have a way of getting past people's defenses and and connecting people uh, and humans more directly. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the, in the U.S., we have a whole project with this institute called the you know, Art Place uh, around exploring how this can work. We, we have uh, Welcoming Week, uh, which Pittsburgh takes part in every year, um, where there, there are events where arts and culture can be used. Um, but yeah, whether it's through uh, film, uh, whether it's through uh, events that incorporate art, uh, art uh, and culture, uh, yeah, it, you have to get to people's hearts sometime in this yeah. work. Um, you, you can't forget that piece. People are human. Um, and um, art has a way of doing that in ways that um, some of these more kind of regimented approaches just just never can. So it's an important piece, like I said, of the toolbox, in the toolbox. Thank you. Thank you, David. I appreciate that. Um, we have another question. There's a lot of questions that are coming in. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being so engaged. Um, uh, Joseph Desmond is asking, um, what safety net nets exist in German um, uh, detention centers, is what he calls them, for LGBT migrants and other minorities. Um, can some, is someone uh, familiar with these uh, types of, um, uh, you know, what, what the situation is there? I'm wondering about whether you mean detention centers or reception facilities. We have reception yeah, facilities. I, I, I in... do believe, yeah, I read it completely like they, they wrote it. I think the, the reception centers is, is probably what is meant by this. Um, but just like the safety net um, infrastructure that we find in these, um, in these uh, facilities. Especially, I I... Yeah, especially for LGBT and other we... minorities. I wish I had uh, something worth sharing, but yeah. would have to hand that one over to David <laughs> if he has some worth, something worth sharing. And really all I have is, uh, is experiential, uh, anecdotal. I do not have the, the data on this, um, but it, it, I know that it's the problem. I, I, um, we work, uh, one of the communities we work with is, uh, is Dresden, um, in, uh, you know, obviously in Saxony, one of the more, uh, or most conservative, uh, at least on this issue, part of, parts of Germany. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, but welcoming takes welcomers uh, and yeah. uh, spent an evening uh, at the Christopher Street um, sort of uh, LGBT association because they're very involved in the welcoming work in Dresden. And they had an event specifically for people, LGBT people who had come Syrians, uh, this was back in 2017, who had recently come uh, out of the, the, uh, the, these facilities where they, the reception centers. And I know that they were having a very hard time. There is a lot of, uh, there is homophobia in those centers. I don't know if they've done a better job now of, of uh, doing better, uh, of, of helping support people, but I do know that they had some pretty horrific stories that they shared with us that evening. Um, and it was very sobering. Um, but also inspiring to see the, the um, members of the Dresden community 
um, welcoming them into their center, but also they had integrated them really into their lives. Um, and so, uh, yeah, welcoming communities can, can help, um, but you still need those protections in place uh, at when people are first arriving. Um, and yeah, it's complicated, but again, you, you can't, uh, in the same way that you need balance uh, that, that Victoria talked about before, um, sometimes this, this violence against LGBT refugees is by other refugees. And so we can't paint refugees or immigrants as these you know, perfect individuals that, that don't do anything wrong. Like there are challenges um, that need to be recognized and addressed from all sides. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, thank you for these comments. Um, I want to come back to something that we discussed earlier, and I think, um, Victoria, you mentioned it, and uh, the Consul General as well, um, about the um, situation in Moria, Greece, and, um, you know, even before the, the devastating fire that burned down the, the camp um, and, and leaving so many people without shelter, I think Moria was one of these symbols of kind of the failure of European migration and asylum um, policy and, and kind of a little bit of the lack of political will maybe to find a true European uh, uh, solution. And um, Victoria, you'd mentioned earlier the um, new um, pact on migration and asylum that was proposed by the European Commission very uh, recently. And um, I think it was kind of the hope that it would, you know, uh, be a course away from the current system that we've seen that unfortunately led to, you know, humanitarian crises uh, and human rights violations at the borders. Um, and there's a, an interesting concept in there of, of solidarity that is flexible uh, and mandatory, um, which basically means uh, member states can kind of decide what kind of um, solidarity they want to show. And I'm just curious, What's your assessment of this new pact? Is it, um, is it a true new solution or is it going to be maybe creating a backdoor for some of our member states that are not very interested in, in taking migrants? What's your assessment of that? We don't know yet, but overall, it is clear that this pact rather cements the trends we've seen in the last years instead of diverting from them, yeah. that for sure. The, flexi the mandatory flexible solidarity, wonderful expression, by yeah, the way, <laughs> is really a fascinating animal because in essence, it redefines what solidarity means. Mm -hmm. For five years, we've talked about member states having to show more solidarity. And now we realize since this is not going to happen and some member states will continue to refuse to take in people, let us, instead of asking for more solidarity, simply redefine solidarity so that it encompasses things that member states are doing anyways or want to be doing more of in the future. And that is focus on returns instead. Yeah. There is the new concept of so-called return solidarity, uh, return sponsorship. So member states, can, can show, member states can show their solidarity not just by taking people in and actually relocating or resettling them into their countries and integrating them there, but by um, taking up the so-called return sponsorships, again, you know, some people say somewhat Orwellian, um, where they, whereby they are responsible for the return of people that um, receive a no to their uh, asylum claim. And of course, the basic idea of this is not entirely wrong. The basic idea is simply we have a system that is currently entirely broken. We have a system where the people that arrive and then receive a decision are not distributed into the, into the uh, EU. So those that get a yes are not distributed around and then integrated well, but also those that receive a no are not actually returned. So those two kind of parts of the system are broken. So what this um, new pact is trying to do in part is actually to address these basic misfunctions in the system. The problem with the pact really is that it is absolutely unclear how they want to make this happen. Mm -hmm. There's more questions than answers around what return sponsorship actually means and how this is supposed to function in practice. Because one of the big challenges in returning people is of course that the countries of origin do not want to take their people back, um, in part because they depend on the remittances of these people, um, in part because the identity of the people is not clear. There's many reasons that really, um, that really, it's very unclear 
how this new pact is intending to change that. And that is, I think, also why it is impossible yet, like on this day, to say what this pact's impact is really going to be, because for now, all this is, it's a proposal. It has received a very mixed reaction by the member states and by a lot of people. We are going to see in the next few months the negotiations of the member states, and then we'll see how the initial proposal is going to shift and whether there's going to be some more clarity on some of these big questions that, that we are left with. Um, and then the implementation phase would start. And until then we could evaluate that, it would be quite a while longer. So really it is, do not hold your breath at this stage because there is just this, there were 500 pages of legal text that were dumped onto the public um, two weeks ago with very little clarity on what the newness of this pact was actually going to be and whether this was a realistic uh, attempt yeah. at really changing something or simply von der Leyen delivering on a big promise that she'd made, which was yeah. that she was going to show a new pact and she had yeah. to move. So I think we have to take into consideration also that there was simply a big political need to finally come up with something, with some kind of basic minimum solution that could be presented as the new pact. That's very helpful, Victoria. Thank you for, for sharing your perspective on that. We have an interesting uh, question from an audience member. Uh, we're getting very close to the end, but I would like to read that um, question from Peter Hoing. Uh, considering the 30th anniversary of the unification, is the divide between West and East still meaningful in regard to issues of migration and diversity? Um, in other words, he says, as someone from West Germany, does my perception of Eastern parts of Germany being less open to migrants and diversity still ring true? I think we um, probably have um, discussed this a little bit, but David, can you, can you give us your take on that from your experience in Germany? Um, I, I would say it's, it's like uh, uh, other parts of the world we find. Um, yeah. it's, it's not, the divides are different than what people think. Um, like, I, you know, we, we started doing work in the United States in the South. Um, right. And people think of the South of the U.S. as a certain way, but there's a lot of cities within the South um, that are more progressive than uh, parts of Pennsylvania, for example, okay. um, where I grew up. So, so that's the same way in East Germany. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot of towns and cities that are um, with a lot of people who are very welcoming and progressive, mm -hmm. um, whereas other places are not. Um, and so it's uh, it's not so simple. It's it's not just an East-West thing. It's a rural-urban thing. It's a, it's a lot of different things, um, but there are, uh, you know, if, if you need to, if one you know, wants to try to uh, look at generalizations or trends, like, the, yeah, I mean, yes, the East is, as a, as a whole, uh, has more challenges, and there's a lot of historical reasons for that uh, versus the West on, on, on these issues of migration, and, um, you know, we, we could get into the history of that. Um, but it's, it's, it's complicated um, and yeah, it's complicated everywhere, um, but there are welcomers everywhere and there are welcoming cities in all places in the world. That's what yeah. that's our experience. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I want to remind our participants uh, on the line that we have a survey. Um, so before you disconnect, it would be great if you can give us your feedback on today's conversation. Um, unfortunately, we're almost at the end. Uh, if Victoria or David, if you don't have, if you want to share any last, you know, remarks, you're most welcome. Um, otherwise, I will hand it over to uh, Steve Sokol um, uh, from the American uh, Council on Germany to close out this uh, conversation. But David, Victoria, if you have any last uh, remarks, you're most welcome to. <laughs> All right, I'll just put in a plug, uh, just yeah. putting in, uh, if you want to learn more about our work, uh, there's our website on the chat. Uh, yeah. And if you want to email me, there's my email, but I'm grateful to have had this opportunity to, uh, to, to bridge my different worlds uh, and speak with, uh, with you. Yeah, so thank, you. thank you, David, and same here. Thank you to both of you. It's been an absolute pleasure and I'm really appreciative of you taking your time. Steve, over to you. Well, I just wanted to give Victoria the opportunity to put in a plug for the great work she's doing at the German Council on Foreign Relations as well, if you want to do that. 
our webpage is dgap.org. Uh, come and have a look at the work that we're doing. We're focusing on migration management and migration communications. Right now, working on a big project on uh, EU Africa migration dialogue. So thank you very much for your interest and write an email if there's anything that you thought was particularly insightful or in fact, particularly not insightful and also very happy to receive criticism and comments of all kinds. Thank you. So I have the distinct pleasure of, of saying thanks. As some of you know, the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh, as well as the network of World Affairs Councils across the country, and of course the American Council on Germany are organizations that are near and dear to me as are the cities of Pittsburgh and Berlin. So I'm particularly delighted that over the last hour, we were able to connect Pittsburgh with two speakers in Berlin and with viewers across the country and on both sides of the Atlantic. I want to thank all three of you for the nuanced and thoughtful discussion about a very complex issue that affects communities in Germany and the United States. And so on behalf of the American Council, on Germany, the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh, as well as the World Affairs Councils of America. Thank you, David. Thank you, Victoria, for your insights and for your expertise. And Regina, you did a fabulous job of leading us through this discussion. So I just want to say all three of you were truly wunderbar together. <laughs> thank you so much. I'd also like to thank Consul General David Gill for setting the stage and, and making sure that we were on the right track. And of course, to our viewers for the many, many questions that we received. Regina did a great job of incorporating as many of them as she could. And I think it's always a good sign when we leave people with more questions after such an informative hour. I hope the, uh, we have the opportunity to, to cooperate again in the not so distant future and that we'll all be able to see each other sometime soon. Until then, stay well, everybody. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you, take care, guys. <laughs>